Baseball is back, and there really is nothing like a home team advantage. That's why Team Toyota makes an obvious choice for your next vehicle purchase or service. With their MVP pricing guarantee, teammates reward program, and streamlined customer experience, their award-winning sales and service departments are there for all of your vehicle needs. A home team advantage is nothing without family and community. Their employees are part of the family, they're part of your town, and we're all part of the team. Visit TeamToyota.net and choose one of their three locations in Langhorne, Glen Mills, or Princeton. It's a new week, it's a new series, and you know what that means. It's a new Phillies Talk podcast presented by Team Toyota. I'm Corey Seiden. He's the closer, Ricky Batalico. Our producer is Spencer McKercher, joining us in a little bit. Ricky, I'd be remiss not to just bring this up right out of the gate. Spencer Strider has damage in his UCL, his throwing elbow. Uh, There's a lot going on with the Phillies right now, but this seems like the biggest topic in the National League East, maybe in all of baseball right now. Uh, it does not look like he will be returning anytime soon to the Braves. He's getting a second opinion as the week begins, but they might be looking at missing Spencer Strider until around this time in 2025. So, you know, if he's gone for a while, there's no doubt that it changes the landscape of the NL East. I guess the question is by just how much, just how much do you think that would affect the Braves? Well, I, I want to look back to the opening series. We saw what Max Fried was bringing in that opening series. He wasn't great and he was all over the place. Uh, they said he's have he's been having problems throwing a lot of strikes. So that that's that was strike one on them right there. He, he didn't look good in that game against the Phillies. Then you move and you find out Strider's probably. I, I mean, let's face it: when you start going for a second opinion, that usually means the first guy told you bad news, and you want to hear something different. Um, but how does it change everything? It's a lot. The Braves have to go fishing in a pond and try to find some starters now because that rotation without Strider is nowhere near as strong uh, as the Phillies rotation. I think it just gives that Phillies that extra little bump that they may have needed all all season long. This is a team that was right there on the heels of the Braves. I know the Braves have been this juggernaut during the regular season, but I got to believe that this may either even them up or actually put the Phillies in front of them right now. I know the Braves have have a really good hitting team, um, and they got some guys that could do some damage in that lineup, but not all season long. It doesn't work like that. I mean, the pitching's got to be there for you. If they don't have their pitch, a, a good pitching staff, I think they're going to be in some trouble. Yeah, and Max Free got bombed again in the first inning of his second start. Um, you know, you look at that Braves rotation. Charlie Morton's 40 years old. Freed is a free agent at the end of the season. Chris Sale is never, you know, he hasn't made a full complement of starts since, I believe, 2017. So it's asking a lot out of him now as well. Uh, To your point, though, the Braves offense, it has gotten off to another hot start. They lead baseball in pretty much every single category. So they are going to try to slug their way to another NL East title. But the Strider injury, in my opinion, it opens this thing up a little bit. Does it make the Braves a mid-90s win team as opposed to like an 100 to 102 win team? Remains to be seen. Uh, Atlanta does have a lot of starting pitching depth at the upper levels of the minors. They have A.J. smith Shaver, the uh, rookie we saw last year who had some velo. Enoa from a few years ago who uh, missed ample time. They also have Bryce Elder. But, yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting development. You never want to see a guy go down like that, especially one of the best in the game. But um, that's the reality right now for the Braves. Well, and he, no, you, 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 you have to look at it this way. You put yourself in the Phillies' shoes. If that was Zach Wheeler that went down and Aaron Nola was pitching bad, I mean, wh- where would they be? Absolutely. We, our, our, let's face it, our our uh, thoughts on where they would be by the end of the season aren't going to be the same. As a matter of fact, I bet you, you know, well, the Phil- in this division, they're coming in first or second. I think we know that. We see what We see what those other three teams are doing, and it's not pretty. But so maybe a little bit of lady luck there. But I I just think when you lose you lose top starters and one of them's not pitching well, you're you're going to be in some trouble. I don't I don't you could have who you want in the minor leagues. I mean, the Phillies have Mick Abel. Would he be able to come up and fill the shoes of Zach Wheeler? Answer is probably not because, of you know, a lot of pitch limits, things like that. They're not going to let him go deep into games unless he's dealing like no hitter wise. But I think it really just comes down to the fact that. These guys at the top of rotations are really, really good. And when you lose them, it puts a dent into what you were thinking for the season. Yeah, no doubt. That's the exact perspective to put it in. Is it imagine what would 
imagine what the Phillies would be thinking and going through if they just heard that Zach Wheeler was out for the season. That's the exact sort of impact Strider makes for them. Um, so, Ricky, in Phillies land, they you know have had an uneven start to the series. They, they won the series over the weekend in D.C. They head to St. Louis uh, looking to kind of get going here offensively, still searching for it. Uh, specifically wanted to you know take your temperature on center field because here we are, we sit down, the Phillies are 10 games into the season. Johan Rojas, one for 22, one for his first 22, hitting 045. Christian Pache got a start in center field to end the weekend, but really haven't gotten any production offensively out of that spot. And when the Phillies entered the season, the, the refrain was, you know, if our top eight guys hit, we can live with that in the ninth spot. Well, so far, they haven't clicked. They haven't clicked the way they expect to. So I guess the question is, if the top eight isn't hitting, how long can you live with that in the nine spot? I think right now, I mean, what is he, one for 22? And his one his one hit was like a six-foot full swing. So, I mean, it's not like – he looks overmatched. And that, I think that that's the part where the Phillies would be concerned. I mean, if he was hitting some balls on the screws, okay, fine, we could deal with the one for 22. But – you know, I always said, at what point are you? Is it a detriment to Johan Rojas, not just the Phillies? I mean, does it become one of those things where, okay, he, he's he's going to hit under a hundred for the year? I don't think you could keep anybody at the big league level. I think they're going to try to give him a month. I think they're going to try to push it as far as far as they could. But you know, at some point, you have to take a take a back seat and say, all right. Is, is this guy going to get better at the big league level or does he need to see pitches at the minor league level and get at bats and feel better about himself? There's also there's also the little kiss of death in that one. If he gets sent down and he's hitting under 100 down there, then what? I mean, so there, there's, a, there's a lot going on here. I mean, we obviously love his outfield, uh, but Pache is no – no joke out there either. He could go get get a lot of balls. A lot of people were asking me this morning, does does uh, Rojas catch that ball last night? That ball for any center fielder, the one that Pache went into the wall, that ball is about a two percent chance of anybody catching that. And so Pache made a really good it, effort. Yeah, yeah, he gave it a great effort. And if Rojas were to catch that, that would have been an unbelievable play. So. You can't take one play and judge center field because of that. I think Pache could cover some ground. He's got some speed. He gets good jumps off the ball. Not as good as Rojas, but he's still up there. The guy could field the position. Um, I was all for this, at the, you know, a couple weeks ago. I was like, yeah, I didn't think he would be this overmatched this quickly. Um I don't know. Is it going to take one breakout game? I mean, he could have a three for three game and feel 100 percent better uh, about himself, and nobody will say anything anymore. You know, four four for uh, four for twenty five is a lot better than you know one for twenty two that you dribbled. So I, I just look at it this way: is he is he going to kind of fall into a better spot? He may, but if this continues like we're seeing right now, where he's not even on the fastball. It, it's kind of scary uh, for him as a as a major leaguer. And I even said this on on Sunday. I think it, no, it was Saturday. He got a breaking ball first pitch, and he kind of took like a half ass swing at it. And I'm thinking to myself, has he even seen the ball out of the hand? That that might be his problem right now that he's not getting a good look and not identifying the pitch. Yeah. Uh, you know, I asked Rob Tom, I'm on this road trip. I asked Rob Thompson the other day, um, is there a certain point where it's not no longer a small sample size? And he said, no, there's no like, there's no specific number of plate appearances. He's just looking at a, the at bats and B uh, the, like the, the confidence that Rojas has or does not have after them. And he said so far, you know, he's still walking around. He's still confident. He's not moping to him. That's a good sign. But you know, if that's the best thing you can say about a guy a few weeks in offensively, um, I guess the other part of this, though, is that there's no obvious solution. Like the the obvious offensive solution would be, okay, you could move Brandon Marsh to center field, and you could play a Whitmerry field in left, or you could even potentially experiment with Schwarber out there one day a week in left field. But that makes the Phillies such an inferior defensive team to what they are. You know, Brandon Marsh is a high quality corner outfielder. He's more of like an average defensive center fielder. Whereas when you have Martian left and you have Rojas or Pache in center, you have an above average outfield defense. 
So it's not like there's an obvious solution. Christian Pache may be a little bit better with the bat, but he himself is a career 172 hitter. So it's not as if, um, you know, the, the, the answer staring right at the Phillies. I wonder if that itself lends more time to Rojas in that spot. Yeah, yeah, you have to wonder. I mean, Pache, now this is his second year here, right? Yeah. And the, the one thing about him, I mean, they're waiting for him to get better. I don't know. You're a team that's going in a direction of you want to win a World Series. Is there – do they have that luxury anymore? I, 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 I'm not so sure about that. I think, you know, number one, you expected one of them to break out a little bit swinging the bat, and neither neither one has done it right now in the regular season. Talked about a 173 average. I mean, that's that's a little surprising that he's here too. So, I mean – you look at both sides, both sides, there's no great answer. You're absolutely right. The answer could be on another team. There are some teams failing quickly in Major League Baseball right now who maybe might have a guy that they don't want to pay and uh, might want to move. So I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if Dombrowski did some moves here. And, it, you know, it, you could do it at any time. So it's just one of those things. It's a little bit of a waiting game. And I think it just uh, comes down to how much patience – they're going to have right now. You know, speaking of midseason acquisitions, we have a little mid podcast edition here. There he is, the Cobra, the one and only. Where Spence. are you there, Cobra? Uh, I wish I could tell you, but uh, I cannot. Spence, I cannot and I were, Spence and I were talking about uh, yesterday just about the sheer number of pitchers that have been injured. It's incredible when you look at this list of guys who either have had Tommy John or are about to have it, huh? Yeah, going going back to the the Strider stuff. Now you have Shane Bieber now um, set to get his surgery, and it's really a shame. And I was kind of scrolling social media the other day, and uh, I saw a clip of Tyler Glass now back in like 2020, 2021, Sucks. talking about you know whether it's the arm angle, whether it's the pitch clock, and he said you know it actually comes down to the balls, these balls that you know he's using muscles that they never used before because they don't have a grip. He's like talking about how the slider. Um, you know, it was going away. He has to put so much effort into his throwing arm and throwing motion to keep the, the ball from not flying 10 feet away. Ricky, I mean, what are your thoughts on, do you think it's pitch clock? Do you think it's the balls? And if so, what's the ultimate conclusion and or resolution to uh, to avoid these injuries? With pitchers? Let's, let's start with the pitch clock. I think that's a farce. I think that's just something that the Players Association is trying to get changed. And this is their angle to try to change it. That is not the case. You don't change your arm angles because of a pitch clock. And it, you're in a hurry, so your arm's going to get hurt. I don't, I'm not I'm not buying into that one. I do buy in to what Glass now was saying. And I heard that same interview. I heard him talking. And it's true. If the balls are slippery, what do you have to do? You have to squeeze more. You have to hold it tighter. You, you hear a lot of pitchers when they're talking to little kids, hold it like it's an egg, hold it gently when you're throwing the baseball because you want everything to be loose and firm coming out of your hand. When, when you're squeezing a baseball and you could, anybody out there, just take a baseball and squeeze it and you could actually feel in your elbow. You could feel like movement in your elbow when you're doing that. And to me, I mean, I know it was the sticky stuff he was talking about at that, at that point. He said he did used to use it. He used to use suntan oil and alcohol. And, and rubbing sweat. Al and just sweat. sweat, yeah. Yeah, and sometimes that gives you a better grip. I know guys back in the day when I was pitching, you could uh, on the home uniforms you could do it. You couldn't do it on the visiting ones. Was you, you would literally pour some rubbing alcohol on your pants and just hit the rosin bag on it, and it gave you tack. Um. I don't, I'm sure guys are still using something. I mean, there's, there's guys get away with it. I know they check the hands and everything, but if, if you're, how about hair gel? Everybody wears hair gel. You go like that when it's sweaty, you know, you get that stick, that sticky feeling and it goes away. What do you, the umpire is going to say, what do you have on your hands? And you say, nothing. It's nothing. I, I gel my hair before the game and I go out there and pitch. Then when I sweat, it's sweat. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's what Max Scherzer was doing because if you ever watch him, he always goes up to his either side of his hair or the back of his head, and you, you get a little stickiness. Now, when when you start to squeeze the ball, it goes deeper into your hand too, which is also causing more muscles to work in on your arm. I completely agree with Glass. Now, I completely disagree with the with the pitch clock. Celebrity cook Steve Martirano brings his Italian American cooking back home to Philly. 
Enjoy Martirano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. Make reservations for Martirano's Prime on Open Table. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rattle this off to you. There's a chart I'm looking at right now of the average fastball velocity over the last two decades, okay? Mm-hmm. In 2002, you want to guess what the average Major League fastball was in 2002? What's, uh, 2002 had to be about 93. It was 89.4 <laughs> was the average fastball in 2003. Which, now, the, now, now the guns are different now. Remember, no, let's fast forward to 2010. OK, the average fastball, 91.2, still pretty normal, right? Yep. 2014, 91.8. So nothing yet. 2020, we're at 93.1. It has gone up literally every single year. Since 2002, 22 straight seasons, the average fastball velocity has gone up to this point where it's now right at 94 miles per hour in 2024. Now, my question is, is that because two decades ago, humans evolved to the point that they could throw so much harder all of a sudden? Or is that because people have now trained themselves to try to throw harder? And in training yourself to try to throw harder, you're altering your motion, you're altering the the arm path, and you're you're clenching up, you're muscling up, you're doing what guys used to do, you know, to get a little oomph later in the game. You guys are doing that every pitch now. I mean, I, when I look at why these injuries are caused, I would have to think that it's the obsession with the velo- with velocity and the fact that from the time kids are like 16 years old now, they want to be throwing 80 to 85. Watch this. I, I'm going to throw this question back at you. Good how time, many kids that come up from the minor leagues, they do throw hard. How many kids know how to pitch when they come up? And I'm talking about know how to work the corners, know how to you know paint on the on the uh, top side of the strike zone, know how know when to throw breaking balls, when to do this, how to set up hitters. They don't do that anymore. I I had a great conversation with Joe Blanton in Florida, and he says one of his last years, he he would normally pitch setting up hitters, blah blah blah. He told me you can't set them up anymore. They're always looking for one pitch. So in each at bat, guys normally, unless it's a hanger, guys are normally looking for one pitch or one area. So if you stay out of that area, you should be in pretty good shape, which is why you'll see guys go out there and like to Nick Castiano, Castellanos, throw that pitch away that goes out of the zone, away that goes out of the zone, and they do it constantly. And to me, that that's not really pitching. That's just throwing to one area. Uh, I think these guys, if you watch them warm up, watch them spin. They always spin. Aaron is not like that. Wheeler's not like that. Those are kind of old schooler guys still. I mean, they've been around a while. Watch a lot of these young guys, especially the bullpen guys. They'll throw the ball, and they're spinning sideways afterwards. What does that do? Pressure. You could, If you even go like that. You could feel pressure go throughout throughout your arm. I think that's a main reason, which is because of velocity. Because if they're not throwing the ball hard, they're not making it. A couple things. One, it again underscores how blessed the Phillies have been that that Wheeler and Nola have stayed healthy throughout this entire period. You knock on wood because not only have they stayed healthy, they've done so carrying the biggest workloads in the National League during the last half decade. The other part is I don't think this is ever going away anymore. This problem because you know I saw this clip of Chris Bassett, the Blue Jays starting pitcher, who is one of these old school guys who lives in the low 90s and does it more with command and finesse. But he was saying that you're just disincentivized to to be someone who comes up and knows how to pitch as opposed to a guy who just like goes all out with velocity. Because he said, if you look at the results, that if you're a guy who has like his his comment was he's pitched with guys who had a 4-7 ERA, but through 97-98. And then guys who had a 3-7 ERA and through 91-92. And the following season, the guy who had the 3-7 ERA is getting a non-roster invite to spring training. And the guy who throws harder is getting the guaranteed major league deal. So as long as the incentive is still there, why would it change? I mean, I just I think we're kind of, you know, uh, spinning, spinning, spinning our wheels if we think that this is ever going to change again. It's just kind of the way it is in, in the evolution of pitching and the way teams strategize. Yeah, because I mean, I saw a picture of Strider's throwing motion, and Rick, you can talk more about he this. Spins. Well, that and his arm was down compared to like Nolan Ryan, you know, in the eighties and nineties. His arm was straight up, where Strider's arm is kind of at like a horizontal angle when he's launching the ball. Obviously, that has something to do with it. And it was funny, kind of talking about speed and stuff. Uh, the kind of Brogdon trade, you know, I heard I was reading 
that, you know, it was like, oh, the, the guy that we got back, Robles, he was like, oh, he throws 100. And it's like, well, who doesn't nowadays, right? Like all these kids now are throwing 100 constantly. So it's just another, you know, another speed guy, I guess we're going to bring in as well. Actually, though, the bringing up the Brogdon trade, Ricky, that's a good example of like how quickly confidence can change for a guy, huh? I mean, just remember how like it looked like he had finally figured things out. He mowed through the Braves and the Astros in that 2022 postseason and then just hasn't been able to put it together since. What did you make of all that? Some guys crumble. I think that's the best way to put it. I mean, you have a couple bad outings and you can't dig yourself out of that hole. And the other thing for for Connor was that his fastball was losing velocity. I mean, pretty much every game you look at it and it's down two miles an hour, down a mile and a half, down two. When 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 you're a fastball changeup guy and you lose your you, you lose your fastball, that's a bit of a problem. And he, if you look at him, he's one of those guys that was trying to find more. And when when you they used to tell us sometimes less is more. So when you were struggling, your your mind tells you you need more, you need more, you need more velocity. And I had that problem early on in my career where I was like, all right, I, you know, I had a bad game. Now I got to throw the ball harder next time, and it and it never worked because first and foremost, when you throw the ball harder, your your velocity's go, you try to throw the ball harder, your velocity will go down because what you're doing is you're squeezing the baseball, your muscles are tight, nothing's loose, you're not just free and easy. And that that is where I think Connor Brogdon was, is that you, you look at his last appearance here, it was like, I'm going to throw this ball through the through the backstop and nothing was coming out. So I, I think there were a couple things. Obviously, his mindset was poor and then his velocity just kept going down, down and down. You got to fix your mechanics. Yeah, Brogdon's early season performances and opening day skewed the numbers of the Phillies bullpen, but they have really rounded into form since – you know, over these last nine games. Uh, and one of the guys who was the final members to make it was Junior Marte, who's retired 16 of the 19 batters he's faced so far this season. So the Phillies bullpen has been pretty much the unit that you expected. They also have Orion Kirkering, who could be back this weekend. The Phillies want him to pitch Tuesday and Thursday on his rehab assignment, see him pitch, have a day off, pitch again, make sure he comes back. And if he comes out of that okay, sounds like he could be activated this weekend. But I got, I got a I got a question for you because I noticed this a lot in yesterday's game. The umpires stink. <laughs> I mean, they are bet this is the worst I've ever seen them. I, and I don't know if it's lack of concentration or one of those things where it's like, well, you know what? Sooner or later we're out of here anyways. I I, ju- I just think they have been I atrocious. I so, mean, go back go back uh to game 2 of the season. Nick Castellanos Fastball right down the middle. Middle, it ends up turning into what two or three runs that inning against Freed there. Yeah, against Freed. Yeah, and it, it, I saw uh, Alfonso uh, what, Marquez. Marquez. Yeah, I saw that he had an eighty nine percent accuracy. Eighty nine, which was one of the worst so far this year. It's it's unacceptable. And obviously, Boom at the end of the game, not too happy with the outside stuff. And that then was Jose. A strike, though. Yeah, yeah, and then Jose, you know, was getting a little upset as well. Real quick on Junior too, I think. I saw some blame for him yesterday. That that ball, I mean, what are you going to do? He comes in with runners on the corner, you know, and comes in and lets up a sack fly. But do you think Junior can get to the point, you know, it's kind of been a topic on social media lately. Can he get to that point where we can trust him like we trusted Jeff Hoffman last season? The, the only answer to that is to start putting him in those type of roles, which is why they probably did it yesterday. You know, you put him in a role that's a little – uh leverage high and see if he could perform see if see if anything changes about him i thought he just went out and threw the ball i mean you're going to give up sacrifice flies it's it was the walk before it maybe that that might have hurt him a little bit more but i i, lo- I look at it this way i he's got the stuff and you it's just got electric too. you, you got to develop the mindset to be in those games that that mean something so it, it's it's that's just going to be a matter of time you can't th- there's no magical answer that yeah he's he's the guy you need in the in the eighth thing no there's no magical answer well i mean they're kind of easing him slowly you know into more leverage roles and it's what they did with jeff hoffman last year you know jeff hoffman proved that he could handle um a two run a two run deficit for example and then he would move into slightly higher leverage and then by the by the middle of the season jeff hoffman was pitching into huge spots and 
you know, not the junior Marte is going to get to that point yet, but he did enter with runners in scoring position, as Spencer mentioned on Sunday, on Sunday, and he picked up five outs to get the Phillies uh, toward the end of that game, did his job. So like the bullpen has been pretty good so far. The starting hey, thing. When, when I first started my first year, Jim Fergosi did that to me. He would put me in like in the sixth inning, maybe a one or two run game. We, we were either down at first. And then after about 10 outings, he was like, well, you're setting up now. I mean, it, so it was that quick. It's just a matter of the player being able to go in there and accept what he's doing and don't panic in the situations. And some guys figure it out later than others. You know, some guys figure it out when they're 28 or 30 years old, as, you know, the, the Phillies last year found Hoffman, who was later in the game, and it just everything clicked, the opportunity, the stuff, what he had learned to that point, the team he was on, the environment, and you see what happened. Now, one aspect of the Phillies that's been pretty sloppy here to start the season, Ricky, has been the base running. Uh, the Phillies come out of the weekend – They've been caught stealing six times, which leads the majors, and they've been thrown out six times in situations other than caught stealings, which also leads the majors. And if you remember, we were having this conversation last April when the Phillies led the baseball led the majors in outs on the base paths, but then they kind of like they cleaned it up because they ended last season pretty much middle of the pack in terms of outs on the bases. Rob Thompson said we asked him about this on Sunday, and he said it's really tricky to strike the right balance with it because when you start talking to the team about it, when you start having meetings about it, then everybody becomes tentative and they lose their aggressiveness. And they don't want to run. Um, but I think the Phillies are being a little too aggressive right now. You know, you have Kyle Schwarber stealing bases. He had a bad read on the line drive by Bryce Harper. Uh, you can't be given outs away when you're not hitting yet, when you're not slugging yet. No. And that, and that's really just knowing what's happening on the field. I think they, they've also been getting caught in situations where they're stealing bases when everybody knows you're stealing. They're, they're very successful when it's like sneak. I'm going to sneak up on you and Schwarber's going to steal third base. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're very uh, good at that. But, yeah, in the situations where they've been needed is when they're, when they're struggling the most. And, yeah, I mean, you look at it. I can, I can name a bunch. You said Schwarber yesterday. How about Rojas comes in to pinch run that day? He gets picked off. I mean – this is all about about paying attention. I mean, really, when you're on the base pass, pay attention to what's going on. Know what the pitcher has. I think you can go in, look at film of their pickoff moves, look at film of what they do on second base, you know, and you can't assume. Like, a guy might look once back and then go. Look once back, go. All of a sudden, he looks once, you go. He looks back again, and you're, and you're, you're in the middle of no man's land. Um you have to have an idea if the guy's going to change his his way of going to home plate. So, I mean, I think that's a lot of just paying attention, and I think it's a lot of studying, uh, which would be pregame. It was funny because <laughs> on Friday when uh, the chaos that happened with Bryce on on third uh, and then JT trying to steal JT second. JT should have been on third base. It was crazy. And I, th I wish we could bring the listeners into – the office in the in the newsroom with with Ben, Ricky, and Michael during that entire instance. Why we have uh, the WWE event going on outside too? It was just pure chaos in here. It was. It was. Is that, it was, was that when I got that video of Randy Orton right around on a four wheeler? I was dude, it was unbelievable. They're doing, and then he came walking back, which was the best part. Well, I was <laughs> I was super jealous of John Crook for getting to live out my dream and go to WrestleMania in Philadelphia. It just so happened, of course, happened during this first Phillies road trip but it looked like it was a wild scene back there was that were there any other highlights other than uh Randy Orton riding around right oh, there were a lot of there were a lot of championship belts out there apparently there's a lot of champions that were in the parking lot it was just chaos like you know it's funny because we we all work in tv obviously and just seeing the chaos and Sue and Michael Barkin turning around and freaking out seeing Randy Orton in a golf cart with a cameraman chasing after them. <laughs> Ricky just freaking out, you know, and all of a sudden we look up in the TV and it's showing it live, you know, and we're all like, how do they do that? It's like, imagine if you guys were out in the parking lot before you walked in, you could have been part of, part of well, history. We, we were going to invite Randy up here to see if you wanted to like RKO Ben or, or Ricky, you know, and kind of see who can <laughs> really, win the team, <laughs> really win the team. Like I'd have taken one for the team. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, <laughs> like random stuff like that. Obviously, we have the Eclipse uh, as we sit down and record this on Monday. Big Eclipse, guys. Are we excited about it? I'm going to be doing radio, so I probably won't even see it. Well, okay, so the, the moon's going to block out the sun. How many people do you have blocked, Ricky, on, on Twitter? I don't know. I just <laughs> if they say something they don't like or they don't they don't like one of the shows I'm on. Why, so why are you even listening? You know what I mean? 
And that, that's me. I just block them. Okay, you don't want, want to hear from me? Bloop, you're blocked. Yep. I had a guy yesterday tell me, ha, ha, to, to me and T-Mac, ha, ha, John Crook got mentioned. You guys are jealous. And I, went, I put something <laughs> like, sorry, I just really don't care. <laughs> I mean, what? Why? why am I jealous? I'm on TV enough. It's so good. I think um, I have, if I had to guess, I have like 750 people blocked. No way. A thousand people muted. Yep. Uh, I also, you know what I started doing last year? Makes a big difference for my mental health. <laughs> is I started muting certain words. So like, oh, yeah. it always has pissed me off when I'll, you know, guys have ripping off three straight weeks of solid performance and you acknowledge it and someone goes, oh, way to jinx them or you jinxed them, right? <laughs> so I've muted the word jinx. Like now it's I just, so anybody ever... If anybody ever accuses me of jinxing anything, I'll never see it, right? Yeah. Um, when someone says, now do blank. Like if you like if you say, Junior Marte's retired, 16 of the 19 batters he's faced, and someone's like, okay, now do the offense. So I, I've muted anybody who ever responds with that. Now do, that's an instant mute. Well, we, we got it. We got it yesterday on pregame. We were talking about JT's pop time, <laughs> and they steal five bases. Yeah, well, there you go. That's and I was, he's actually, so there's two games this week or last week that Phillies had five stolen base attempts against them. So, I mean, Christopher, Rob Thompson did say that it seemed like the national might've been picking something up against Christopher Sanchez because they were going on first move. Yeah. Something, it's definitely something they want to clean up because, you know, and this, I thought this was well put by Thompson. He said, most games that they're going to outslug their opponents, most games they're going to have more power in terms of velocity than their opponents. The way that teams beat them is on the base paths. And we definitely saw that to end that national series that the nationals are a team that that's the way they're going to scrap their way to wins by making contact and trying to wreak some havoc. And you're just not used to seeing JT real Muto have a game like that. Although, you know, one of those stolen bases was a throw that Bryce Harper just couldn't make the second base where he dropped the ball. Um, But yeah, I mean, are you concerned about the way you're seeing teams run on the fills, Ricky? Uh, I am, but I think it's, I'm not, I'm not concerned about JT. It's not his fault. I think the Phillies just aren't holding runners or they're being, uh, see through. I mean, you know, I th- two of those guys in the game against the Nationals were that was off of uh, Sanchez. So, you know, uh, you're you're not going to get everybody. It, it's just one of those things. Maybe I talked about studying, you know, pitchers. Maybe other teams are doing a lot better than the Phillies right now. You know, I saw that JT the five is the most in his career. It was four. And now it's it's five, which is shocking, you know. And we have we haven't been used to seeing JT get beat as much, but he still threw out a few runners this weekend. So it's not like he doesn't have it, like you said. I think that's just the the way the Nationals are going to try to claw out some games. Um, we'll wrap it up here with the closer. Bring in Ricky. Uh, Ricky on pregame the other day, yep. uh, we were talking about the Phillies were going for their first sweep and their first road series uh, of the season. Their their first sweep since two thousand one. And you were a member of that team back in 2001. You actually pitched all three games, three innings, no one runs, four Ks, and the big goose egg with walks. Do you remember that? Talk us through a little bit what I, that series was like. I remember it because it was Larry Boas. That was his first uh, man, or first games as a Phillies manager. And the first game went extra innings. I remember that. I was, I think I pitched maybe the seventh or eighth inning. And then that, that game ended up going uh, longer. And Amari Telemaco got the win in that game or the save in that game, something like that, which was a weird thing for us. But we ended up winning that game. And then, yeah, I pitched in the next two games. No problem, I guess. Can you imagine Can you imagine being on this team right now where, you know, Robin, obviously we understand it's early in the season and stuff like that. But imagine Rob being like, hey, you know, you pitched two-thirds of an inning yesterday. You take, take the next two days off. Oh, no. Do you I, think you can still be pitching right now? I probably could have. Yeah, <laughs> probably would have saved my arm. But I was, I was, I didn't have the mentality to sit around this long. Like these guys, you know, they'll pitch one game and who knows when they're coming in the next. I didn't have that mentality. I wanted to, I, I wanted to be ready every single game. Like if, if there was a goal ever to pitch all the games, I, that would, that would be my thought. I know you can't do it. But I mean, reality is if I could have pitched every other game without like every time, every other game, I would never have had any arm problems because that's just the way it's just the way, you know, your body would need it. You get one day off, you come back the next day. My biggest problem was like, if I pitched it three days in a row and I only got one day off after that and then came back, warming up was a problem because you were still, you were even more sore that you didn't pitch. 
Oh, okay. Interesting. So the four out of five, if you had the fourth day off, but then we're pitching the fifth day. I pitched five out of seven of those that, that year. That's awesome. Six well, innings, five out of the first seven games. Well, I'm looking at the box scores from that opening series. And um, I mean, that was a good Marlins lineup. Luis Castillo, Cliff Floyd, Preston Wilson, Mike Lowell, Charles Johnson, Derek Lee, some, some names there. They could hit. Also, it also brings up the question I've always wanted to ask you, Ricky, which is, do you have any good Eddie Oropesa stories? <laughs> Eddie Oropesa. <laughs> what a name. Little, little sidewinder. Little sidewinder. He wasn't afraid. Little, he, was like he was funny. He was funny because he didn't really guy. understand the language very well. Looked like he must have set up for you that day. So, all right, that's a good trip down memory lane. The game has definitely changed. Relievers don't go three days in a row much anymore at all. Uh, no. Managers are more protective. Again, it goes back to the point we were making about velocity. Guys are throwing 100 every pitch, so kind of catches up to you. But I'm sure we'll have more uh, pitching injuries to discuss throughout this season because it's just the reality of baseball. The NL East was shook up by that Spencer Strider news, and now we'll see how much it impacts the Braves, the Phillies, and everything else. So thanks a lot for listening to the Phillies Talk Podcast. For Ricky and Spencer, I'm Corey. We'll catch you later in the week.